Did you know that if something is said enough times, we will believe it to be true regardless of whether or not it is? If it's said enough, we just kind of accept it as, as truth. And there are all sorts of examples of things like this from our lives, things that we've heard enough times that we tend to believe them to be true. Things like cracking your knuckles will give you arthritis. I'm going to go three, two, one, and then after one, I want everybody to crack their knuckles, okay? <laughs> Everyone silence, silence. Three, two, one. Oh! Yeah! <laughs> Although, uh, kind of disgusting. Uh, cracking or popping of your joints is actually nitrogen bubbles bursting in your synovial fluid. There is no harm in cracking them, and the bubbles will return after about 20 minutes or so. Yeah. Did you believe that your blood is both red and blue, depending on whether it's coming or going from the heart? Yeah, that's not true either. Blood is always red. It is a slightly darker shade of red when it is oxygen deprived, but that is the only change in color that we get with our blood. Did you know whose blood is blue? Horseshoe crabs. Not only is their blood blue, but it is worth $60,000 a gallon for its uses in the medical field. They drain 30% of a horseshoe crab's blood and then return them back to the ocean. Did you believe that a penny dropped from the Empire State Building could kill? That's one that we used to say. If you dropped a penny off the top of the Empire State Building, it would kill you. That's not actually true either. A penny can only reach a top speed of 25 miles per hour. And that's after a mere 50 feet. It doesn't matter how much higher you go up. Um, so it, it really doesn't matter how much high you take, how high you take it. Penny can still cannot kill you. Okay. And three, two, one. from the Empire State Building is not gonna hurt. I mean, it hurts a little, but not a lot. You'll be all right. That barely does uh, more than just kind of sting you on its way down. Other truths that, that you may believe that aren't really true, uh, lightning, it often strikes the same place twice. Yep, ostriches do not bury their heads in the sand, Twinkies do not last forever, they only last about 25 days, honestly, and the Great Wall of China cannot be seen from space, believe it or not. Yeah, but we've repeated a lot of these things enough times that we believe them to be true, even though they aren't. Some truths are not really truths when you look deeper into them, but then there are other truths which the longer you look into them, the more true it actually becomes. I know that we just celebrated Easter. I don't know about you though, but for me, I'm not quite done yet. I'm not ready for the Easter season to be over. There was, there was so much to think about and to talk about during Jesus's last days before his resurrection that I think I'd really like to travel back to the cross once again. I don't feel like we've spent enough time there this year. And the cross, it is one of those truths that the more you look at it, the more amazingly true it becomes. You've heard me say before that I believe, truly believe that the Bible is the holy, inspired, without error, word of God, hand delivered to man. The Bible has proven time and time again that it is not only historically accurate, but it is spiritually and scientifically accurate as well. And although it was written by many people over thousands of years, miraculously, it tells one cohesive story from the beginning to the end. The love story between God and his children and how his children kind of mess things up, but how God planned from the very beginning to fix it. And, and we know that this is a story 
And how do we know that he had a plan right from the beginning to fix it? That he wasn't just winging it, that he came up with it at the last second? Well, if we go back to the beginning of the Bible, the beginning of the story, um, we read in the third chapter of Genesis, first book of the Bible, third chapter, right after man ate the fruit and brought sin into the world. We see God, and he's dishing out the punishments to man, woman, and also to the snake for the repercussion for their sin. And listen what he says to the snake in Genesis chapter 3, verse 14. Cursed are you above all livestock and all wild animals. You will crawl on your belly, and you will eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put an enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike at his heel. That, folks, is referred to as a prophecy. It's a prophecy. And what is this prophecy about? Well, with the eating of the, the first fruit from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, sin and death entered into the world. This meant that the devil had secured a victory in separating God from his children. But there was one event that was going to close this gap. One event that would give man access to heaven. One event that single-handedly defeated the devil. What was the one event that crushed the devil's head? Well, that would be Jesus' death on the cross. But the devil did strike at his heel, did he not? Yes, the devil killed Jesus in a very painful manner. And the devil, you could say, won that battle. But in winning that battle, he lost the war. Jesus' death on the cross was part of a plan to redeem man even before man existed. And we know that it was part of a plan because we read about it through Scripture time and time again. Where do we see it in the Old Testament? Well, we see it in prophecies. What are prophecies? Well, prophecies are predictions of something that will come true. They're not guesses. They are predictions of things that will take place. There was a, a law in the Old Testament that uh, if a prophet got one thing wrong, they were to be put to death. Because prophecies come from God. So they're always true. And if prophecies did not come true, then either a prophet isn't a prophet or God isn't God. So when we look back to the Old Testament, we see all kinds of prophecies, predictions of what will take place. And although the Old Testament prophecies never mention Jesus by name, they talk about the coming Messiah who will save the people. And they prophesy this over and over and over and over again. They prophesy everything from where he would be born to where he would be buried and a whole lot of stuff in between. So we've got all of these prophecies in the Old Testament that were supposed to come true when Jesus came to earth. Now, it could be argued that Jesus knew the prophecies, so throughout his entire life he purposefully did things that would fulfill them. Mm, I don't know that you'd have a good argument there, but I would counter with, what about all the prophecies that were fulfilled, um, that were done by others besides Jesus? So there were a lot of prophecies that Jesus wouldn't have had any control over because they were things that were done to him or things that were out of his hands. For example, Jesus couldn't arrange where to be born. I mean, he wasn't born. <laughs> he couldn't line that one up. Jesus couldn't arrange what lineage to have or how he would die. But all of these things were prophesied about in the Old Testament. There is a professor by the name of Dr. Stoner who once held a huge study within the scientific community to calculate the odds of Jesus fulfilling these prophecies that we find in the Old Testament. And he took just eight of the Old Testament prophecies and calculated their possibility of happening. Number one, the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem, prophesied in Micah chapter 5, verse 2, and it is a 1 in 280,000 uh, odd. Number two, someone would come before him and prepare the way. That one comes from Malachi 3.1. That is a one in 1,000. Number three, he would enter Jerusalem on a donkey. Zechariah 9.9, 9, one in 100. Number four, he would be betrayed by a friend. Psalm 41.9, one in 1,000. 
Number five, he would be betrayed for 30 pieces of silver. Zechariah 11, 12, another one in 1,000. Number six, those 30 pieces would be used to buy a potter's field. Zechariah chapter 11, verse 13, that is one in 100,000. Number seven, he wouldn't speak when on trial. Isaiah 57, 3, one in 1,000. And number eight, he would be crucified. Psalm 22, 16, one in 10,000. What Dr. Stoner did was he looked at these prophecies, gave them their odds of them coming true, and then combined all of their probabilities to, to see what not just the probability of one of them taking place, but eight of them taking place would be. And the mathematical a number that he came up with was a total probability of one in 10 to the 17th power. One in 10 to the 17th power, or this number. That's a big number. Yes, it is. That is a big number. And that's just for eight prophecies being fulfilled. Okay. Well, how, how big is that number? Like, if I'm comparing it to something else. Well, the odds of winning Powerball are 1 in 292,201,338. Yeah, that's the odds of you hitting Powerball. That's the odds of these eight coming true. If you bumped this number, this eight prophecies uh, filled to 48 prophecies filled, then the odds jump from uh, the previous number to one in 10 to the 157th power or this number. That is a big number. Can you even fathom how large that number is? Jesus fulfilled 48 prophecies. The probability of that taking place is that number right there. That's crazy. And so many of these prophecies, they're not just even recorded in the Bible. They were recorded in historical documents being performed by people other than Jesus himself. So we're not even just talking about Jesus. We're talking about things related to Jesus, which were prophecies that were fulfilled. They couldn't be fabricated. There couldn't be a great big giant conspiracy to make them happen. Do you understand how large that conspiracy would need to go? No, the only explanation is that these things were God-ordained from the beginning of time. And no other religion besides Christianity has an overwhelming amount of scientific and historical evidence that show it to be absolutely true. Yeah, and when it comes to Jesus' sacrifice on the cross, there are all kinds of prophecies predicted and fulfilled. Prophecies that Jesus wouldn't have had any control over. I want you to listen to some of this. I want to spend the rest of the time focusing on the cross. Isaiah 55. The sovereign Lord has opened my ears. I have not been rebellious. I have not turned away. This was a prophecy which was fulfilled when Jesus lived a life without sin. Verse number six. Uh, same chapter. I offered my back to those who beat me. That was a prophecy fulfilled in Matthew 27, 26. Then he released Barabbas to them, but he had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified. Same scripture continues. My cheeks to those who pulled out my beard. I did not hide my face from mocking and spitting. Prophecy fulfilled in Mark chapter 16, 65. Then some began to spit at him. They blindfolded him, struck him with their fists, and said, Prophesy. And the guards took him and beat him. Isaiah 53, 7. He was oppressed and afflicted. He did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter and a sheep before its shearers is silent. So he did not open his mouth. Prophecy fulfilled in Matthew 27, 14. But Jesus made no reply not even to a single charge, to the great amazement of the governor. Isaiah 53, 9. He was assigned a grave and the, with the wicked and with the rich in his death, although he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in him. 
prophecy fulfilled when Jesus hung on the cross next to the two thieves, and then also fulfilled in Matthew twenty-seven fifty-seven. As evening approached, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who had himself become a disciple of Jesus. Going to Pilate, he asked for Jesus' body, and Pilate ordered that it be given to him. Joseph took the body, wrapped it in a clean linen cloth, and placed it in his own new tomb he had cut out of the rock, the grave of the rich. Can you begin to understand how many prophecies were fulfilled and just how impossible it would have been to plan out these events? And if you are looking for, in my opinion, the single greatest chapter of prophecy in the Bible, all you have to do is look to Psalm chapter 22. It says this, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Sound familiar? It was Jesus' words on the cross directing us to this section of scripture. Why are you so far from saving me, so far from my cries of anguish? My God, I cry out to you day, but you do not answer. By night, I find no rest. Yet you are throned as the Holy One. You are the one Israel praises. In you our ancestors put their trust. They trusted and you delivered them. To you they cried out and were saved. In you they trusted and were not put to shame. But I am a worm and not a man scorned by everyone, despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They hurl insults, shaking their heads. He trusts in the Lord, they say. Let the Lord rescue him. Let him deliver him since he delights in him. All my bones are on display. People stare and gloat over me. I just believe that Jesus was whipped so severely that his ribs, possibly even spine, would be exposed from the beating that he endured. My mouth is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You lay me in the dust of the earth. Jesus declared, I am thirsty. Dogs surround me. A pack of villains encircles me. They pierce my hands and my feet. Do not be far from me, for trouble is near and there is no one to help. Many bulls surround me, strong bulls of Bashan encircle me, roaring lions that tear their prey open, their mouths wide against me. I am poured out like water and all of my bones are out of joint. Did you know that one of the reasons they would drop the cross into a hole was so that when that cross slammed against the earth, it would pop your shoulders out of joint, making it harder and much more painful to pull yourself up on the cross in order to be able to take a breath each time you needed to breathe, therefore resulting in a quicker death. They divide my clothes among them and cast lots from my garden. My heart has turned to wax. It is melted within me. John 19, 34 says, Instead, one of the soldiers pierced Jesus' side with a spear, bringing a sudden flood of blow and water. Jesus' inability to breathe 
from the pressure of hanging on the cross, coupled with his extreme loss of blood, would have put him in heart failure. And with this heart failure, it would have started to collect water in places in the body, including water around the heart, known as a pericardial effusion. This would eventually cause Jesus to die of a heart attack. My heart has turned to wax. It has melted within me. When the soldier pierced Jesus' side, it punctured the heart, having blood and the water from the pericardial effusion flow out to show that he was dead and died from heart failure. Thousands of years before it happened, it was prophesied that Jesus would die from heart failure. You didn't believe that. Do you know how many Old Testament prophecies Jesus fulfilled? Conservatively speaking, around 300. That number, those odds, would be absolutely insane to attempt to calculate. When I tell you that the Bible is supported by science, I am not lying and I am not exaggerating. You would be a fool not to believe in this one-of-a-kind book. Why do I tell you all this? Well, because I th think we needed to spend some extra time at the cross. But I think sometimes we need to step back and, and marvel at this book so that God can be praised. Let us today praise God, a God who is wise enough to put events that plan events thousands of years in advance. Let us praise God who not only plans out these events, but then tells people about them ahead of time and the truth that is coming. Let us praise God for a son who came down to earth knowing precisely what was going to happen to him, all the things that were written about. And let us praise Jesus for his incredible love which gave him enough strength to follow through with what was promised. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. God bless. Hope to see you soon.